Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Nicholas Nickleby Review Miniseries brought to you by Cup of Hemlock Theater. I am your marketing manager and co-producer of this miniseries, Mackenzie, and I'm joined by my friend, the literary manager here at Cup of Hemlock, the resident dramaturg, and also the co-producer of all things The Cup and Nicholas Nickleby related, Mr. Ryan Barakovich. Hello, Ryan. Hello, Mick. How's it going? It goes, it goes. I mean, we're in a, di- we're, we're, we're in a bit of a different setup today. I'm recording from an alternative location without my green screen. So this will be the one random episode that doesn't <laughs> look exactly like all the others. But that's okay. We, we, we like to shake it up every once in a while. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I do have other fun classic books and history books on my shelf here so yeah like every episode you've done a different image behind you on your green screen so this just pretend <laughs> this is one of the images it's perfect all good. perfect perfect uh what's in your cup today good sir uh i'm drinking coffee in my the cup cup hey it is an cup. early morning that's the show we're on yes yeah. so we are filming this one pretty early so coffee for me how about you i am drinking a cup of earl grey tea from my mug ah so meta right (laughs) your mug and my cup (laughs) there you go love that so let's dive into this we are now episode six of nine so we are getting toward the Mm -hmm. end this is logically where an intermission would happen in part two of the play uh that makes sense based on where we left off yes Yes, yeah, so, so so we ended on a quite an interesting cliffhanger, which we'll get into. But first, Ryan, give us a summary of what's happened before and what happened in this episode, just so for for the viewers uh, at home. I, I won't. Sure, I won't belabor the before because hey, you can watch a previous episode if you exactly. want that. Hey, it's probably maybe it's somewhere in the corner if we remember to do that when this goes live. <laughs> so, uh, but basically, the main things last episode was our very Kate centric. Uh, episode where we see a lot of her going ons in London and how she's being harassed by Mr. Hawks, Lord Frederick, mm. and their band of creepy, creepy men. Yes. Um, uh, so that was kind of the big sort of going ons. They were uh, encroaching themselves in Kate's life more and more. She had mm. this new job working with this very fragile lady whose name Mrs. I Whitt- keep forgetting to write down. Mrs. Wittitterly, thank you. So she had a new job working for her and like escorting her to the opera, reading books aloud to her, and mm-hmm. these men found find ways of, uh, you know, making themselves uh, present to her at all times, despite how much she obviously does not want that. Yep. And uh, they also uh, force themselves kind of into her mother's circle, Mama Nickleby, yeah, and showed how charming and dapper and wealthy they are to instantly get her mind flashing of oh she can marry one of these rich handsome folks who are definitely awful. Um, so so that's been like the whole Kate thing from the previous episode. And mm-hmm. uh, Newman Noggs, after witnessing a lot of this, uh, wrote a letter to Nicholas mm-hmm. over with the Crummels, yep, uh, to inform him of what's been going on mm-hmm. and our previous episode ended with Nicholas deciding he has to leave the theater troupe at once so that he can go intervene with his family in London. Yep. So we left off with Nicholas and Smike on the road. Yep. This episode uh, begins back with Kate and she's reading a book aloud to the lady, what's her name? What teacher <laughs> um, Yeah. Yeah, with Titterly, I'm never going to remember that, and we might never see her again after this episode, so I'm not going to exert the mental energy on it. (laughs) Um, So, uh, yeah, Kate's reading aloud to her, and then Miss Wittitterly asks, uh, how did Kate become acquainted with those charming men they met at the opera? Mm -hmm. And so Kate talks about, oh, I met met them at my uncle's sausage party. And, uh, you know, she's kind of like being very cold and cagey about the conversation. When who happens to show up at the door? Why, it's that same band of creepy blokes. And they, you know, they go up to Lady with Titterly and they're, you know, not out charming, charming. And they're like really just same as they did with Mama Nickleby earlier. They're really getting themselves in her good graces. So, and it's like, yeah, it's clearly a targeted 
uh, you know, gaslighting thing for Kate that like, oh, everyone around you thinks that we're very charming. So clearly you have to agree as well. And you're going to get all this pressure from everyone, you know, Mm -hmm. but the plan simultaneously works, but also kind of backfires on them because after they leave, uh, Miss Wittichley, she was kind of like glaring at Kate a bit during her, you know, trying to stay away from Mr. Hawks. And she says that, oh, it's very improper of you, Kate, to have been so forward with those men. And so Kate kind of basically she's very justifiable. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. If when yeah, she's done nothing wrong and is, you know, really, I think, to any uh, spectator, very clearly making her lack of interest quite known in Mm -hmm. her speech and body language. Uh, So, yeah, so miss what's her name is like oh you're being very problematic in how dare you have a conversation with those men when you are a single woman and you're a private conversation with mr hawk that's what tips her off yes mr hawk is lounging very grotesquely on on the sofa and it's it's a very it's a very which is clearly kate's fault yes clearly (laughs) yeah so the kate you know, does not respond well to this accusation and she kind of like has at it with Mrs. What's her name and kind of like says, no, it's the opposite. I really hate these guys. And Mm -hmm. I was hoping that you as a woman can like, you know, be my ally in solidarity, but that's why are you being so cruel? Um, You not just a woman, but a more senior woman than I. And that word senior (laughs) Really sets Miss What's Her Name off. Oh, yeah. Because she's like, How dare you call me an old woman? You are. And then she, like, you know, has a panic attack, a, a psychotic Crying episode. Fit. Something happens. Yeah. Crying fit because she's just so gosh darn fragile. <laughs> um, a very over the top melodramatic orders. fit. Yes. And orders Kate to leave. And mm. yeah, that's. That that maybe is the end of that character. Hard to say. Um, we'll see. So that's our kind of like first little chunk uh, with Kate and the fellas. But don't worry, they're all coming back. Mm-hmm. So then we cut over to uh, Nicholas and Smike, who have just returned to London uh, after, you know, we just saw them leave the theater troupe in the previous episode. Yep. And we get this kind of like interestingly staged surrealish montage of the wealth uh, inequalities of London where we get people like extravagantly eating in like a weird choreographed slow motion while the poor look in through the window and you know cool they, so, uh, uh, trust me, we will get into stuff. that moment we will get into that moment I have some okay. thoughts I, I don't have a lot to say about it I'm just I feel like it was it took up enough time that I felt like it didn't make sense to leave it out of the summary but <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I don't have a lot about that. Um, but yeah, so then he uh, tries, Nicholas, he's trying to find Kate and Mama Nickleby and Newman Noggs, but he can't find any of them. But then who does he happen to run into on the road? Why, it's the Creeper Gang. And they're all just walking there and loudly talking about Kate Nickleby by name. So yes. obviously Nicholas is able to realize these are the guys from the letter. <laughs> um so, yeah, they're hanging out in some kind of bar or restaurant, and Nicholas approaches, and, you know, he stares down Mr. Hawks and, you know, insists, tell me your name and give me your card. Here, I gave you my card, because I guess that's how you provoke a fight back in yeah. the Victorian era, by giving someone your business card. <laughs> Come and <laughs> the find times me. have changed. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, Mr. Hawks is being very... You know, I don't have to do anything for you. Me, 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 me. <laughs> and, uh, but his Clever friends, girl. Lord Frederick, and yes, <laughs> uh, Bob Peck. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, but uh, his friends, Lord Frederick, and those two goons, at first, they're kind of like, or the goons at least, are kind of like, who sort of muscling up on Nicholas and threatening yeah. him. But then when Lord Frederick decides that he kind of wants no part of this and he's going to leave the two goons follow him because I guess he has more of the money. Yep. <laughs> Leaving Mr. Hawks alone with mm. Nicholas. It's also worth noting that in the previous scene in the in the ladies parlor, mm. uh yeah, Lord Frederick kind of s- seems to observe s- things similarly to what the lady 
observe between uh, Mr. Hawks and Kate, but seems to have maybe taken different conclusions from it because he also had like an awkward moment of, oh, I'm kind of uncomfortable by what's going on between you two. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we can see this like, you know, tight knit little mm. group of basically rich thugs kind of deteriorating from the inside. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Nicholas is waiting <laughs> for uh, Mr. Hawks to leave the bar, but he's just like getting increasingly more drunk. And when he yeah. leaves, they go out into the storm together and get into some fisticuffs yes. <laughs> and, on his yeah, coach. They, on his coach in the middle of a storm. Mm-hmm. Very, very, very uh, potent image. The way they stage that scene. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Then Nicholas returns uh, to Mr. Noggs and Smike, all bloodied in the face. But Another wounded that, cheek. <laughs> yeah, but he seems to have won the fight. <laughs> um, and they decide, Nicholas and Smike, that they're going to go home. And Smike makes a big thing about home, your home. And Nicholas is like, our home, Smike, because they're going to go visit and presumably continue to live with Kate and Mama Nickleby. Uh, so yeah, they show up at the at the Nickleby residence, and Mike and Kate meet for the first time, and yeah, Mama Nickleby and Miss Lacreevy is there, and they also meet Smike. And Mama Nickleby is very distraught to learn that Mister Hawks and company are such wretches because she yes. thought they were so charming, uh, which I kind of that that part sort of I thought was I don't know. We might get to this more in a bit, but the yeah, you know, it's set up this big thing about how oh, this is going to be a big obstacle that Mama Nickleby is kind of like setting up this like arranged marriage possibly behind the scenes and like mm-hmm. going to side more with Mister Hawks, and then she just finds out that he's a bad guy, and she's just like boom, fixed. Like <laughs> considering how much time we have and how many plot points, it's sort of you know it's kind of disappointing when they settle them just way too easily yeah Yeah. (laughs) Um, okay so they're gonna return to miss lacreevy's and then nicholas and kate have this sweet kind of sibling moment where he promises that he'll never leave again and he's going to write uncle ralph a letter uh to you know cut ties between their little family unit and him that they're no longer going to take his mm. money and they're they're not going to be dependent on him anymore they don't need him so then cut to uncle ralph's office and yeah. who shows who shows up why it's mr mantellini or mantinelli i can never get that right um mantellini yeah the milliner <laughs> and he shows up and he informs ralph about the the little fisticuffs that transpired between Nicholas and Mr. Hawks, a relative and a business partner who how scandalous, which was apparently in all the papers, but Ralph hadn't heard about it. So Ralph hadn't read that particular paper yet in the morning. Yeah. And the papers didn't name Nicholas by name, uh, but no, Mussolini no. yeah, is like, they, oh, they it was your nephew. It's a fight. Yes. Mm-hmm. So that happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and now Mr. Mantellini, his real reason for being here isn't just to spread the juicy, juicy gossip, but is because he needs another loan. And we saw how the last one worked out for him. Not good. <laughs> yeah. So uh, they're haggling over the number when who else shows up? Mrs. Mantellini and Mrs. Na- Miss Nag are both there. And they show up to stop this loan from happening. And uh, Mrs. Mantellini kind of basically says that she's I don't know if it's officially divorcing but she's severing her ties with her husband she's and, separating she she's yeah. divorcing yeah they didn't use the word divorce and I don't know with Victorian sort of marital I think law, they did how, use the word divorce they uh, used Ralph the word says, separate oh separate okay yeah so Ralph yeah. says like a woman separating from her husband yes so how unorthodox yeah. she's like I got the money so yeah, so, yeah, Ralph was trying to say, but, like, oh, your husband owns everything. It's, not, you know, nothing. But mm-hmm. uh, but because, you know, he's defaulting on all of his loans, everything's going up for sale. And who happened to swoop in and buy it all? Why, it's Miss Nag, who's now going to go into business <laughs> as partners with yeah. Miss Mantellini. So they don't need, yeah. you know, their very overdramatic husband. Man. Yeah. Which explains now, he- why, when they reopened the shop, Kate was not rehired because Miss Nag was pulling yeah. some more 
person. Which makes me think this scene should have happened before then. <laughs> like, but, you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so Mr. Mantellini does his whole ah, I'm gonna kill myself thing, but, you know, there's just too much girl power in the room for anyone to buy that anymore. Which, rightfully so. Mr. Mantellini. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I, I don't know if we're going to see him again anymore. I was surprised that we saw him now after Kate was fired from the millery. I thought that was going to be the last we saw of them. So, I yeah, knew, they're, they're fun. I, I knew that they were coming back just because Ralph does have a, a, a part in their story. And it, 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 it's part of Ralph's loaning thing. So I knew they were going to come back eventually. Okay, um, I wasn't so confident. I don't know. I'm always surprised by who does or doesn't come back in this story, just like <laughs> with the, all the different threads they've set yes. up in bitter detail, like, and then some just get dropped and others keep coming back. Cough, Lily Vic, cough, cough. <laughs> um, Don't count him out yet. But I, I know that's what I'm saying. I'm surprised he's kept coming back as much as he did. I'm sure he'll probably find a way to be important <laughs> again or not, but he'll still be present regardless. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So anyway, after all this Mandolini drama ends, uh, Newman Noggs brings Ralph a letter that's marked urgent. And we know uh, that's the letter that Nicholas said he's going to write to Ralph, severing all ties. Yes. Um, and something then Ralph, just before he reads the letter, he's sort of just musing to himself. Uh, all love is cant and vanity. So he's very down on the idea of yeah. love and how it gets in the way of business. But then he kind of has a musing look on his face and we think, oh, crap, he's thinking about Kate. Gross. Um, so, yeah, that that happened. Then we get like this brief little scene in between where we cut over to Mr. Hawks and his, you know, chums. And mm -hmm. his his face is all bloodied and he's basically bedridden. So I guess Nicholas yeah. really did a good number on him. Well, he fell uh, off his horse. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, he did fall off the horse, so that, you know, weird. Yes. Uh, something that I kind of just love about this story, like, as, you know, this is like the third or fourth time that Nicholas has solved a problem with violence. <laughs> like, it was like, it is just kind of like, our hero is this, like, very well-bred, well-spoken, highly intelligent, educated fellow, but just yeah. solves all of his problems with punching. He's, like, basically Indiana Jones, or he's kind of like the dumb jock bully of his own story, but he's always hey, in the right. he was defending his sister's honor. <laughs> I know, it's just gotta like, considering how they also go to all this trouble to establish how smart and talented and everything he is too, it's weird that just every problem gets solved with violence in the end. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so Mr. Hawks is planning his revenge that once he's up on his feet again, oh boy, yeah. is Nicholas gonna have it in store for him. Yeah. But Lord Frederick is listening to this and he gets up and, you know, he sides with Nicholas in the conflict he says that, well, you, sh if it would, you know, I think you were wrong to not give him your card and tell him your name. This is on yeah. you, buddy, bud. And I'm not gonna, I'm not yeah. gonna just be your echo chamber and support you and all this nonsense. Yeah. And so, like, clearly, yeah, Lord Frederick has taken a shine to the Nickleby siblings, and mm -hmm. he's not, you know, he's yeah. choosing his loyalties well. Oh, Lord Frederick. Yeah, so like, you know, maybe Kate will marry him in the end. He seems like he might be half decent. But <laughs> that's, kind of, that's, my, that's my speculation of where this might be going. Right. Um, but yeah, we'll see. Don't spoil anything. Okay. Um, so then Nicholas goes to the employment agency that he had been to before, all the way back in episode three. Mm -hmm. And it's all the same postings that were there and all the same work. And we get some like narrative monologues about all the jobs. And who does he happen to meet there? A man by the name of Charles Cher Cheerible, who, <laughs> so, so when this actor first showed up, uh, the actor's name is uh, David Lloyd Meredith. And yes. we've seen him before in a lot of the ensemble work, but specifically yep. as the parliamentarian, the last yes. time that Nicholas was looking for work, which yes. kind of the fact that, you know, he had a slightly different costume, but that beard is so distinctive that like, yes. <laughs> I I thought, wait a minute, is this the parliamentarian again? Is he actually coming back after the big long setup he got? Yeah. Uh, but no, it's just the same actor and a different character. <laughs> um, so that was I wish I had my book with me right now. There's a great drawing of of, of the uh, charitables of the charitables that would make yeah. it look, look kind of like Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Yeah, 
that's you know i could see that's the vibe they're going for us in the casting and acting so yeah this is just like a nice nice swell guy who's you know very eccentric and you know chatty but he just takes a shining to nicholas just like based on pretty much nothing Mm -hmm. and it decides that i want you to tell me your whole life story come with me to my office yeah (laughs) uh put a pin in that because we had another little scene in between (laughs) yes we do Uh, so we're back uh to ralph in his office who's being very wistful about kate gross Mm -hmm. um yeah you know, I guess that is so what he was thinking about, about love is all can and vanity. Yes. Uh, but then who shows up at the office? Oh, snap, it's Mr. Squeers. I told son. you he was coming back. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I was, I, I was, I'm not surprised that they're coming back. I just don't think it was as telegraphed as you seem to think it was in that <laughs> one day more sequence. But anyway, <laughs> so yeah, Mr. Squeers and son arrive at office. Uh, and this is 40 minutes into this, like, less than an hour yeah. long episode, we'll say. Um, I wrote that down because I thought, like, okay, it took him long enough. We finally uh, got him in here. Because that's, like, an hour and 40 yeah. minutes into play number two after we yes. haven't seen them since play... Episode since, like, two. two. Episode yeah. two. Yeah. Yeah. Aside from the brief appearance during the song, which doesn't really yeah. count in my books. But... Uh, so, so, yeah, so they're there. They're just, like, mm-hmm. you know uh yeah you're yeah. catching up with ralph when ralph finally reads the letter that mm-hmm. uh newman nuggs gave him from nicholas in the previous scene and he's yeah. all like caught up in thought there and uh he he immediately starts asking uh squeers questions about this boy smike yes and smike yeah so we get a little bit more of smike's backstory ralph mm-hmm. was like how did how did he come into your care and yeah. squeers says that a uh, mysterious man dropped him off but the money stopped coming in after six or seven years but mm-hmm. he kept him on staff because he was a good compliant worker yeah until nicholas threw a wrench into that damn nicholas mm-hmm. Uh, Ralph asks Mr. Squeers where they're staying while they're in town, and he's staying with a man called Snolly, which we remember that that's who dropped off those two uh, children yes. in the very first episode, the two Snolly Correct. kids. Yes. Um, yeah. And so now, after Squeers and Son leave, Ralph is planning, you know, very you know, evil monologue. He says that he knows that the way he's going to get to Nicholas and wound Nicholas is through his friend Smike. Hit him where it yeah. hurts. Go so, for yeah. the heart. <laughs> yes. First we attack <laughs> yeah. the heart. Yeah, very, very green goblin of him. <laughs> and I also will say part of his plan is setting up Mr. Squeers to go after yeah, uh, he doesn't quite say that though. <laughs> like we eggs by the end of the episode, we'll, yeah, yeah, we'll we'll get to that by the end of yeah. the episode. But that I kind of just writing down what yes. happened in that conversation. He doesn't yeah. quite do that. If that conversation did happen between them, it is completely off stage. Ah. So back, cut back to Nicholas. The uh, he's gone to Mister Charles Cherival's office. And he's introduced to the accountant secretary guy, Tim Lincoln Walter Water. Tim Lincoln Water, who, you know, wins the Beard Hall of Fame. <laughs> uh, and yeah, he he meets <laughs> Charles Cheerable's brother, Ned. So here we have these two. I guess they're supposed to be twins because they're pretty much identical, but we have, yeah, the, the Cheerable brothers and these two just kind of funny, identical in both appearance and personality guys. And and they're just like they are so happy to meet Nicholas, and they want to. And part of their plan, uh, in terms of giving Nicholas a job, is that they think this Tim Lincoln Water is probably ready for a life of leisure retirement. He's getting very old; he probably doesn't need to work at it as much. Uh, Damn you, Tim no, Lincoln Water! Tim Lincoln Water. <laughs> Tim Lincoln Water will not have it. He's slamming the desk and the table like, no, I want to die at this job. Rawr. <laughs> How dare you insist that I live a life of leisure? <laughs> uh, but then he kind of just turns around after like a, two seconds like, oh, okay, fine. Well, if you want to hire the boy, maybe we'll see. But I'm not going anywhere. Like, uh, I'm staying so, home. Yeah. So yeah, no interest in leisure for Tim. But these very nice guys have gotten Nicholas a job. 
and Nicholas kind of has like his little monologue. Uh, it's hard to tell if this is supposed to be a first or third person monologue, but he kind of muses on the fact that these brothers are so uh, so nice yet so unrefined that most people in London would probably shun them because they eat with a knife, is how he put it. Yes. Uh, which I'm not sure how he determined that since he hasn't shared a meal with them yet. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, he's like, wow, the people who would like shun these brothers for being unrefined are missing out because they're like the nicest dudes. They are. Uh, also, also, I kind of skipped over this part, but there was a young woman in Ned's office mm-hmm. when Nicholas showed up. And we don't know, like, they called her Madeline, I think, but we don't really know what her deal is or anything. But she and <laughs> Nicholas made instant eye contact with each other. So basically, continuing Nicholas's trend of I fall instantly in love with every woman who isn't Fanny. <laughs> so let's see how this one goes, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, so and then we also get this brief cross cut of cutting back to Ralph reading Nicholas's letter and uh, Roger reading, like Roger as Nicholas reading the yes. him aloud kind of. Like, so yeah, this yeah. very like hostile attacking of Ralph yeah. and we don't want you or your money, which kind of then goes back cycling through the head of what was motivating his yes. attack the heart comments earlier. <laughs> so then we cut to our last little scenic unit of this episode. Mike is walking around in a crowded market. He sees some yeah. pretty jewelry on a table. He's looking at it when, oh no, little Squeers, not so little Squeers boy, tackles him and he's yeah. accosted by Mr. Squeers who beats him senselessly and Mr. Snolly is there too and the three of them grab Smike and they're taking him back to Yorkshire. Yes. And that's they exit into the auditorium through the aisle and end of this episode we're going into an intermission. Yeah. Who? Big a lot of stuff happened in this one. Big summary. A lot of stuff did happen. This was a very full episode of content. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Clearly, you can tell it's the end of an act uh, of a certain well, yeah, that... of a play where they are building towards a big cum- cum- cumulative moment. Well, yeah, and it's interesting that like the previous intermission, not the one at the end of part one, but the one in between part one, yeah. also ended with an act of violence involving Mr. Squeers and Smike. <laughs> like, uh, yes. that this is kind of this is the high yeah. drama moment that David Edgar yes. seemed to realize that you could build the architecture of the play around yes mm-hmm. yeah well so, there we go that is the that is what's happening i will say from a uh book adaptation point um just going through all my notes here i wrote up uh so there's a little bit more cross-cutting done in in the play yes. versus the book like for example the whole mrs nag thing and mrs maitlin thing happens later on in the like uh, 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 in this section of the book, so like um, Mr. Squeers stuff happens a little. His stuff is split in half. The two meet. There's actually two meetings there between Squeers and Ralph that gets split in between the Mantellini stuff. So they group Mantellini and move Squeers a bit later on. Um, uh, the whole um, what's his name, Mr. Not Hockley. Um, uh, when he gets beat up. Hawks, yeah, Hawks. Mr. Hawks. There's there's actually a scene between Hawks and Ralph where they have a bit of a back and forth with each other. Uh, that wasn't in maybe here this that's time. coming. I got a feeling that could be coming because it's been because uh, like there there's a part where he, um, Ralph does reach out to Hawks and he is bedridden due to his injuries and he's close to death, right? Um, from falling <laughs> off his coach. Okay, interesting. Um, so there's a little more of that there. Uh. So yeah, I, I would say I would say this is a little bit more mixed and match. Like they, they're still the same plot points. They've just been reordered a bit to, I guess, build toward that big cumulative act of uh, of before the intermission of uh, Smike finally getting recaptured by Squeer. Something I knew was coming for the longest time, and I was like, "Dear God, when are they actually going to show up to actually get this plot point that they got to capture him?" Um, yeah. So yeah, like it's interesting, especially what you said about like the the ordering of. Yes. of the Mantellini and yes. Miss Nag kind of plot point because we were just saying it would have made more sense for that to have happened earlier to have justified why Kate wasn't rehired but it turns yeah. out that happened even later so that's that's yes. fun to yeah. weird kind of yeah. 
right? Yeah, like, whatever. Kate match is it. back. They're back with the Lacreevies. Nicholas has a new job. Kate will be just fine. It's <laughs> all working. Out for she doesn't. Yeah, it's a, uh, until Nicholas has to go back to Yorkshire to save Smike. And then, uh-oh, everyone's in trouble again. <laughs> we'll we'll see what happens. We will see what happens there. Uh, I will say, I do have a cast shout-out uh, this time yeah, around. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so I want to give, actually, it's a, it's a, it's a mixed shout-out. So, first, it is to Mr. Ned Cherable, Hubert Reese. Mm-hmm. And yeah. the guy who Is he related his, to Roger Reese? I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ned Cherable as uh, played by Hubert Reese. And then I'm trying, I, I totally lost my note here on the other guy's name. I, I just wrote down in the brother in my notes. <laughs> uh, Charles, Charles Cherable, who's played by David Lloyd Meredith. Yes. So the two of them, like the fact that they were able to find actors who, I, I mean, in, in the books are supposed to be twins. Yeah. Uh, so Literally, the fact that they were able they're... to get actors who were so close to each other that they could be like fraternal twins, but like close enough where like you could interchange them. Um, See, to me, it looks like because we've seen the actor playing Charles many times before, or at least yeah. very prominently as the parliamentarian guy. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, Hubert Reese playing Ned has a fake beard on and that kind of sells the look. Yes. So they are modeling both of their looks after, okay, uh david is too distinct yeah. yeah he's he's too distinctive looking so let's just yeah. find another actor in the company who we can make up to look like him which but, i mean yeah, that's I, another I, big shout out for this episode is the hair and makeup team yes agreed like, like the fact like the work they did on um mr hawks's face after the carriage accident where like he mm-hmm. looks really battered up nicholas also gets another scar so we'll Yes, like, which we'll talk about our scar check in. Yeah, or do you want to do that now? Yeah, shout out to the hair yeah. and makeup team this time around because they're yeah, really like, working hard. And I, I, I would agree with your cast shout out because these are the two like big prominent new characters we've been introduced yes. to. I, I really like, like I said, we've seen David Lloyd Meredith before in a similarly eccentric role, but he's doing a yeah. lot of good work to distinguish this character from that one yes. to the point that like when he was first introduced and we just saw him, I'm like, wait, it's at the parliamentarian again. And then, but as soon as he started talking, I'm like, nope, different character. So yeah. good job on him and good yeah. job on the two of them for really mimicking each other very well yes. and create, I, I agree. They are so interchangeable and I love it. And like, there was one moment where like, uh, one of them was talking to Tim Lincoln water while one was talking to Nicholas. And I honestly lost track of which one was which. And I'm like, right. Yeah, I'm like, good, good job. Yeah. Oh, and, it, it, and it's just, their delivery of their lines like just how verbose they are with the damn you tim Linkletter and oh my goodness <laughs> yeah. it's just so big and i just loved how big they went with it that they just hammed it but it wasn't hammy in a bad way like where it was like oh you were just really schmacking this was like yeah. hammy as in these guys are just big like I, 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 we've met people They're and like, and- were just big and loud and they, they just fill the space and they have this interest you can see the history between them growing up together yeah. being like on the same wavelength about everything like every line they say to each other is just like the rhythm is like brilliant and like yeah. they are you know you can tell that yep these are these are siblings who have never not just been completely on the same page about everything yes. uh i i would like to give a secondary cast shout out to yeah or Tim Lincolnwater, who's played by Griffith Jones. He Ooh. really, considering he shares the stage with these two brothers, who we just kind of said, like, really steal yeah. the show, he yeah. still kind of also made himself very, like, prominent and entertaining in that scene. And this actor, he, Griffith Jones... He matched Jones, their voice as well. Like, he, like yeah. you can tell he worked with them for so long that, like, they just have the same yeah. big voice yeah. character. <laughs> So, like, I yeah, I think he deserves, the, if we're talking about the rhythm that these characters have with each other, he's definitely yeah. part of that. And, like, this, you know, Griffith Jones, this is, I feel like, the first, like, prominently named character we've seen this actor in, but he's been in this play so much yes. in just various, like, chorus and group scenes. And he had just, I love the beard. <laughs> he yeah. just, like, he's so, his beard is just, like, so glorious and prominent and, like, just so much gravitas, like, if you remember when we uh, reviewed Paula Vogel's Indecent and uh, yeah. the actor Tom Nealis, who played also played multiple characters and that just like yeah. big, you know, wise beard that yes. just like kind of always made him a standout. I feel like this actor 
Griffith Jones kind of has that same. I, it's so silly to compliment an actor for their beard as an extension of their beard. talent. But that's, but that's what I'm doing here. Uh, the beard is an extension of their talent. And yeah, I feel like I've been wanting to shout him out for a while just because he's such a standout just physically and everything he's been part of. But this, I feel like, is the first real named character that we could actually hang our coat on with him. So yes. giving it to him here. Well, I will also say, fun fact about Mr. Griffith Jones, he played the role of Duncan in the famous Ian McKellen production of Mackers. Ah, that's cool. That is a so fun you would have seen him in that, most likely. Mm-hmm. So there yeah, you go. Like I love just all these all these kind of, you know, distinguished RSC yeah. British actors who just not very few of them are like famous, famous, but yeah, they all have had long, illustrious careers in theater. Yes. Gotta love the Brits for that. They keep bringing all these great actors together. But yes, shout outs to those three men who really did steal the show this episode. I was laughing so hard during that last scene with them in the shop. I just wanted to see yeah, a sitcom no, with those three men. And like I just have like a pre Nicholas Nickleby prequel. <laughs> Like sitcom of just like the chair, um, the Cherubles and Link later, like just like what went on between the two yeah, of them, or Link like, Water, sorry, Link Water, Chip like like Link. a like Link and Water, yeah, yeah, Link, yeah. Tim, like Link I, I would definitely watch like a like like a The Office, Parks and Rec, mockumentary yeah. style yeah. Like workplace sitcom with the three of them. Yeah. <laughs> that would that would be fun. I think yeah. so. Ryan, we should write all that. right. Almost like a Rose and Cranston Gilden sure. but just with uh, Tim, <laughs> Tim, Tim, Tim Linkwater and, and the Cherubles. Yeah, I'd, I'd watch that. Because <laughs> I think I'm going to do some okay, really so funny there. Uh, I want to like maybe skip ahead to our Smike check-in. Yes. Because I, because while, you know, we, we say this week after week, yeah, the Smike portrayal is what it is. Yeah. And, you know, the fact that we are experiencing this in nine parts just gives us nine individual units of being pissed about that (laughs) but something that but like to make it a little different this time because this is actually a pretty smike heavy episode uh there's kind of some interesting smike stuff we can talk about here sure uh well first of all we get some more smike backstory from the conversation between ralph and squeers Yes. But the kind of big thing I do want to sort of when Smike meets Kate, mm-hmm. I think was an interesting moment, especially mm-hmm. for like David's acting yes. that we've been talking about here, because he strings together three complete sentences in a row, which I don't think we've seen him do yet. Ooh. Like he says, I, I, you know, he meets Kate and he's like, you know, doing the kind of wheezing, flailing thing that he yes. sort of always does. But then he says, I'm very pleased to meet you. Uh, He's referring to Nicholas, my only friend. I would lay down my life to help him. And that's like the most coherent we've kind of seen him be. And I think something we talked about several weeks ago is maybe through spending time with Nicholas, he will kind of come more into his own, become more confident, able to, you know, speak better. And there's kind of, some problematic stuff about that is oh the disabled person just needed a friend and now he's slightly less disabled and that's not a thing but uh yeah, no. but it is if if since we're taking issue or have so repeatedly taken issue with the way this character has been portrayed as over the top very disabled completely yeah. like non-functional in the mm-hmm. logic of the play yeah i think there are interesting writing acting directing choices kind of trying to get him out of his shell a bit here even yeah. though the episode ends with him back where he started yes well yeah you definitely can see that he about... regresses very quickly with squeers uh like once squeers shows up he goes back to the mumbling um yeah but he's also himself. being like he's, being. he's also was just tackled and being slapped yes. across the face multiple times so yes yeah yeah. So I mean, yeah. No, it's very so, like, interesting there him, that 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 point that yes, the more Nick or um, Smike does be, like is integrated into Nicholas's world, Nicholas's family, that we do see a bit of a evolution, like from apothecary <laughs> to now being able to speak somewhat to 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 Kate or, or or a female. When in the last episode we just saw him drag a female off stage without a single oh, yeah. word or of consent so i do think there's a nice evolution there showing that 
hey, Nickleby is rubbing off on Smike a bit. They, like, he's helping Smike um, become, I don't, I don't know the word was more acclimated to to society, but yeah. like, like Smike is definitely yeah, becoming I more also kind involved of... within a, a, a social circles. Yeah, and I, something that I thought was kind of interesting is if there definitely seemed to be, I don't know if it's supposed to be romantic, but chemistry, you could say, between Kate and Smike upon their meeting there. I know they don't share a lot of time on stage, but like that would be pretty nice if like Kate just really takes a shine to Smike and sees past his, uh, you know, everything about him and... Uh, but like I, I don't think that's where they're going with this, especially since I also just speculated that maybe her and Lord Frederick will be a kind of thing. But, uh... Well, I will not spoil what happens there. So, okay, yeah, don't, don't spoil I do know anything. I'm just like there was. Story. Well, yeah. So Kate, I don't know. She was just, you know, being her her father's daughter. She immediately yes. showed kindness to smike upon meeting she was like very smiley and like pranced off stage with him and in that scene transition i'm like maybe, maybe there's something there and that would be kind of interestingly progressive if kate would was be. like oh i don't care that you're disabled yeah yeah you know and since they're always going on about how pure of heart this family is <laughs> you know that that would be nice but this is also the same family of nicholas who's being like oh how dare you fanny think that i could be even a little bit attracted to you have you seen yourself <laughs> well i i don't think nicholas so who knows the best moment there mind you it was fanny squares <laughs> but you're so playing into <laughs> you're playing into the play's trap there or dickens's trap or whoever's <laughs> i'm being sarcastic no but no man or woman yeah. should ever treat somebody like that that is what nicholas yes, did just, to fanny was just, just don't downright be a dick. cruel <laughs> yeah that, that was just downright yes. cruel um but yes yeah, well, no, yeah, Smike, yeah, no, yeah, Smike guess, is getting the brunt end of it yeah yeah but i will say this is a this was a better Smike episode because I, I was ranking them on on the Smike scale I would say episode six is a marked improvement from some previous yeah. Smike episodes we've had. Yeah, and I think it, like it's interesting. You mentioned the apothecary a moment ago. Like, what was notable about that episode? I think that was episode four, where yeah, Smike was coming into his own a bit when he was rehearsing with Nicholas, and Nicholas was prompting lines, and then he was able to get it. Yeah. But the second he was actually on stage and he was prompted by someone other than like Romeo for his last line at the end when it turns out everyone's okay yeah. that wasn't real poison uh he he yeah he failed to deliver his line so what they yeah. were kind of showing there is that like yeah Nicholas is sort of his socialization therapist and that are kind yeah. of able to help him along but yeah, yeah he's not quite doing well with others so the fact that he was able to communicate well with kate and to a lesser extent mom and nick will be in this yeah. episode i think is showing progress yeah uh yeah do you want to move on since you alluded to it earlier the scar check-in sure yes let's do the scar check-in new... yes. yeah yeah so i mean the one so um nichols and we's now become like inigo montoya where who have a scar on each side of his cheek <laughs> one for each <laughs> fight he's had in his life who knows, maybe he'll start going after the six-fingered man. Maybe Ralph has six fingers, we don't know. That could be a secret all of a sudden. Yeah. Um, Plot twist, he takes off a glove in the final scene. <laughs> He's been hiding an extra finger. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, like, yeah, Nicholas now has a new scar on his other cheek. But his one, but his one scar on, on his, I guess it's his left cheek, I think. Like, that was pretty much his. Yeah, that... Once again, I just like it because it's a smart way for the directors to show the passage of time in the story because you can lose time yeah. very easily not knowing like it's all is all this happening to nicholas in like a week or is this like mm -hmm. happening over a month and clearly this has been going on for several yeah, when months you just yeah yeah like when you think about how long he spent just with the crumbles then like yeah. uh 
and I don't know how long it takes to travel from wherever it was that they were set up with the theater troupe back to London, yeah. but yeah. we kind of, yeah, we do cut over like the whole traveling mm-hmm. montage, which yes. basically like a later seasons of Game of Thrones where things that used to be very time consuming now have it at breakneck speed, but like, yeah. right? But yeah, so the there star. There's somehow I, in, in one location, then he's somehow in another location. <laughs> Maybe he's a mermaid. <laughs> yeah just like that so yeah i do agree that the scar is a good timekeeper i will say i kind of lost track of the scar especially once all this new bloody bruising kind of yes. came about after his fight with mr hawks like i yes. do kind of I-, I was having trouble even noticing the original scar anymore well, yeah, it's so that big, that i didn't notice it stuff. until they did a really good close-up of his face and i was like oh okay yeah you can yeah. see it slightly like, like it's just a darker shaded ink at this point like it's such a faint scar yeah. now that it's like Okay, like it's still there, but it's like so fake now that like I don't think we're gonna get into the whole Nicholas is identified by a scar routine that I was predicting because I think it's just so faded no. now that people wouldn't <laughs> notice it. But once again, it's just Nicholas who will come out of the story bearing the scars of his past, both metaphorically right. and physically, um, <laughs> and help inform him yes. on who he is. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I'll be curious now that Mr. Hawks has kind of his own scarring situation all over his face, if we're going to see those kind of fade as a, a passage of time as we go, or are those just going to stay as they are? That we'll have oh. to do a secondary scar check-in on him. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, the Hawks scars, which I mean, they look really bad. Like, the fact that like I was like, our, I, the fact that like, when we see him after the carriage fall, um, he's got the thing over, he's got the cloth, kind of like what they do with Harvey Dent and, um, the Dark Knight, where the first mm-hmm. bit where you don't see two faces because he's got the cloth covering, and then all of a sudden he rips it off, and yeah. you see the, the 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 damage of Harvey Dent's scarring, and all of a sudden yeah. Hawks takes it off, and it's like, oh, oh my! Which then made me think yes. that, that, that Bob looks... was uh, Bob Peck would have made a very good Harvey Dent back in the day. Yeah, it probably would have. Like this was shortly before Billy D. Williams was supposed yes. to play it, and then got robbed of the role. So yes. you know, it's never. Thanks, not Joel Schumacher. Uh, <laughs> but you know, there's a lot of things you could blame Joel Schumacher for. But I don't know. I that I, different contracts, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We don't need to yeah. get into that now. But, yeah. Um, um, but yeah, yeah, no. So but yeah, yeah I like I do Schumacher. agree. His scar. But yeah, I, I think, yeah, Mr. Hawks' scar kind of does look more drawn on than I think Nicholas's ever did. It's, yes. I don't know. Keep in mind that there isn't a lot of time between mm-hmm. when the fight scene happens and when we yeah. see him again. Like, yeah. as I was going through these kind of scenic units here, we had uh, pretty much just the Mantellini scene in between before he shows up on stage again. Yeah. So yeah, the makeup crew backstage kind of need to really put it on in a hurry. So yes, well once again, yeah, that's what yeah, we we'll have to remember that. is that this, like, even though we are watching it episodically, this all would have taken place within one act, within one night of theater. So yeah. like, yeah, yeah, makeup would have been very rushed. So so yeah, so that. the fact that it's as impressive as it is yeah. most of the time is mm-hmm. pretty commendable. But I every agree. so often you get something that uh, isn't as yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah, but we'll keep an eye on those scars, for sure. Shall we do our lame is check-in? Yeah, sure, if you got something for it. I do, actually. So, uh, first off, you described the moment of the poor looking in the window. Mm-hmm. That is almost perfectly staged like the opening of At the End of the Day, where out of the shadows okay. come all the poor in the same shawly, huddled mass, and they spread out and become the factory. Uh, but like that opening image, I was like, that is directly from at the end of the day. They just took that. Okay, no, I didn't. Coral shot. I didn't catch that, but that's good. Yeah, yeah they yeah. did that one. Also, um, the use of slow mo action uh, that was done in the carriage mm-hmm. is very similar to what happens at the barricades in the second act of Lame Is, particularly in the final battle when all, when all the students are dying off. That whole slow-mo mm-hmm. makes the action more dramatic type routine with the flashing lights if you watch the original show clips which you can if you watch the 10th anniversary concert that should do show the original show mm-hmm. clips or like the runaway cart sequence uh from the original production same type of thing of everybody moves in slow-mo and the flashing lights help make the action that much more dramatic 
Um, so definitely they took some action cues from here that what worked. Because I mean that carriage sequence is really cool. I have to say that was. Oh, agreed. Yeah, no, it's episode. very well staged. Fight. Yeah, it's extremely well. So the fact that like they're using rice as rain, but because it's flashing. Oh, okay, that was rice. So yeah, yeah. As I, I, so I was looking at that, like, wow, is that what are they? So it is rice. That's interesting. I'm like, it, lo- it looked really good. It's kind of. Yeah. I don't even know. To me, it looked almost more like hail. Maybe that's just because rice is heavier than water is. Uh, yeah, it's sort of yeah, yeah, it's heavier than water, but with the blue and the white light coming through it, it looks, it gives you that rainy, distorted yeah. quality. And I think also if we were watching it from the audience versus um, on the stage versus like, like uh, yeah. uh, versus on screen where we we're getting all on a close ups, I think from far away, yeah. that shot would have looked very Probably. different. But at the same time, you get still get that really kind of intense. It's a rainy, very atmospheric uh, light there. So yeah. yeah, they definitely took some action cues to figure out a way to make their limited action in these stories that much more dramatic. Because yeah, like both yeah. Miz uh, and Nicholas Nickleby don't have a lot of action in them. Like they have little blocks of action moments, but there's a lot of. This scene is the and third talking time Nicholas has solved his problems with punching there's a lot of action in this kind of <laughs> what else is he supposed to do mr hawk deserved it oh i'm not saying he doesn't i just like yeah of course there's action in this he's always punching the whole our main character but it's a rightfully <laughs> deserved punch by nicholas <laughs> yeah as uh, in terms of the latest check-in I, you're bringing up good stuff that like kind of went past me uh the the one as i was sort of racking my brain while watching like do i even have anything for the latest check-in i do think the whole Nicholas returning to save Kate is very like Valjean Fantine like. Yes. Um, but yes, very much. Other so. than other than that, though, I don't. I couldn't really think of anything major. There was one other. On there, there, yeah. there was one other lamezy moment that I caught. I'm trying to remember what it was because I because I wrote down all those other ones, but then there was one other moment that stood out to me, and I was like, oh, "That's kind of lamezy as well." Um, it was something to do with Kate. There was something going on with Kate this time around. Um, well, obviously, her she's whole fired thing with, from another job. She's fired from another job. There's the whole <laughs> thing with Mister Hawks, where she slaps him, which is once again very reminiscent of the whole Batonois Fontaine combat mm-hmm. moment from from, from Les Mis. Um, there was something else in this episode. I'm trying to wrap my heavy brain around what it was. There was something. Um, what was it? There's something else. I can't remember now. I'm uh, totally drawing. If you a can't think it. of it, maybe. Yeah. If you think of it later, we'll come back to it. Why don't we move oh. on to our? Well, sorry. Did you think of it? No, no? I thought of something okay. else though. It. It's my Sweeney Todd sure, check. Go for it. Uh, it uh, so I the don't whole get why we do this, but sure. <laughs> well, we've been doing them, and I mean, and I mean, once again, like this all came out like Liam is and Nickel, or Sweeney Todd and Nickleby were like. Basically, almost like Sweeney Todd was eighty one in, in West End. This is eighty three, and their design look. Well, this the, this was nineteen eighty. This the, the stage show was nineteen eighty. The film version that we're watching was filmed in eighty three. Right. Okay. So once again, so so, so they're so, so they're mixing, but it's the, Sweeney Todd yeah. by one year. Yes. So but there's the whole Ralph a moment there monologuing that is very reminiscent of the infamous Judge song Joanna, where he has the famous ejaculation mm-hmm. on stage, the first ever ejaculation ever uh, mm-hmm. on on stage that, that got cut from the Broadway version because it was being too graphic. Um, but yes, yeah. that whole monologuing, I was like, oh, we're going full Judge Turpin here now at this point. Like, he has gone yeah, full sure. Judge. Where he's like, she is, she, she could be my ward if only I bumped off her mother and her brother. I could <laughs> keep her in my house with me. Yeah. Yeah, creepy, creepy stuff. Uh, yeah, creepy. like it's there if you want it. I just, like, I don't know. It doesn't seem as instructive to me as the latest stuff is. That's that's all. <laughs> I've said it before. <laughs> uh, so I think our last check-in that we haven't done yet, well, first ranking of the episodes, hmm. which then can go into how does this one work as a one episodic unit in its own right. Mm-hmm. So what's your ranking now? I'd actually put this episode pretty darn high. I would put it in like my number two slot, I think, because I think because I think the o- opening of Act Two is still stronger, like the last episode we had, Episode Five, 
I think that's still my favorite. The previous one is that's your okay. I think so because I don't think you called that one your favorite. I don't think you called that one your favorite last time when we were talking to, about uh, it. I think I'm trying to remember which one I had that's my favorite last time. Um, yeah. Um, well, I'll definitely say this is definitely at least in the, in, in like the current high spot just because of the well done imagery with the with the action sequences. Uh, I felt the plot was decently paced. Uh, we were everything was pretty well balanced between Nicholas and Kate. Like Kate obviously started some stuff, but then that influenced Nicholas's story, and then Nicholas was having, and by the after that influence, they met met up. Then you got some nice more building with Ralph because you got to start building that story up if it's going to go anywhere at this point. He's got to have some of his own mm-hmm. time on stage that's not Nicholas or Kate related or not involved, just him doing his thing. So I think this was a pretty solid episode. And I will say that I think it ended in a really good spot as well. So I think this was yeah. a great episodic unit overall. I would agree. Um, for me, I'm just kind of writing down in my paper here, like, mm-hmm. what do I think the ranking is? It's tough that I don't remember what I went with in previous episodes for the ranking. I know, I so, like, if I'm just slotting uh, this one in. Uh, but yeah, I, to me, while this is kind of right down the middle, but on mm-hmm. the high, since we're dealing with an even number, it's certainly on the higher end of the middle. It's number three right. out of six in my ranking. Okay. I'm still going with, I'm still going with, I still think two is the strongest. That was just, you know, the culminating. I think that was my number one squares last time. Leaving Yorkshire. Yeah, I, I still think that just of all the individual episodes, that one really just felt the most kind of triumphant and like yes. had the best beginning, middle and end. Yeah. Uh, I'm still, still to my surprise, I think I still have to go with episode three as my number oh. two spot. Because that's the one that felt like it wasn't going anywhere, but then really came together at the end with the meeting of the Crumbles. And like, yes. the, I think that one still to me has the best book ending of mm-hmm. an arc from starting with We Need a Home yeah. to ending with Finding a Home. So right. I, I will kind of keep giving that episode props for that. Yeah. Then, then I think we'll go with this one. This, mm-hmm. to me, it's it's the certainly I think one of the most action heavy episodes we've had. Not yes. just because there was a lot of fighting in it, but two fight scenes: the one with yeah. Mister Hawks and then the one with Mister Squeers. Yeah. But but more just like a lot of we're finally kind of we're moving through it. We're kind of mm. threads are coming together. Characters we weren't expecting to yeah. see again have come back, and we realize the importance that they are bringing uh, yeah i i like that we are propelling towards a climax here and mm-hmm. that's what this episode does very strongly yeah but since the question as we sort of frame it here is how does it work as a standalone sort of episodic unit mm-hmm. to me i see the fact that it's planting a lot of scenes seeds for big things that are coming later mm-hmm. it's a little less satisfying on its own mm-hmm. on its own terms Right. That like while yeah a lot is going on and I can see where it's all going and why it's going to be important it still feels like a lot of them are kind of disconnected from each other in this episode right. like we kind of we kind of have the big setup and payoff of this episode mm. well there's two of them the first one is uh oh Kate's in trouble with these creepy men which is paid right. off by Nicholas punches the creepy man yes. and that happens just a little too early in the pacing of this episode mm-hmm. that it doesn't feel like the culmination of this episode's arc right. which right. Re- remember we have to keep in mind that for the staging of it they mm-hmm. weren't thinking in terms of these episodes but for breaking right. it up for television and later Broadway HD consumption we kind of have to think about it this way yeah. so that payoff just happens a little too early in this episode but then yeah. we get the second setup and payoff about hey, Squeers is back and we're talking about, you know, Smike factoring into Ralph's plan, which is the final payoff of this episode. But to me, it almost feels like this is too many episodes because of that. Okay. That because we don't see Squeers until after we've already paid off the punching Mr. Hawks like right. thing. So, yeah, while a lot happens in this kind of two episodes worth of action happens in this uh, it kind of feels like a weaker as a one standalone episode to me because it's those are sort of these two neat halves that aren't really in dialogue with each other as much. Right. Um, yeah, and then for just to finish my ranking after this, I'd probably go with five, which is the one we talked about last yeah. time. Yeah, the then one day more. Episode one. 
Uh, oh no, not the one day. Mark. Oh no, sorry. Uh, five the is last... the um, beginning of act. No, if it's five. Yeah, end beginning act... of beginning of play two. Yes, okay. five is the beginning of sec- the right. second play, and yeah, so that's uh, yeah. I thought that one was strong and like, yeah. but yeah, it's sort of between this one and that one, since they both have like yeah. the half position of our six yeah. episodes we've watched so far, slightly yeah. weaker than this one. Uh, mm-hmm. Then I go back to number one, which was like the kind of slow setup, and I yeah. think number four, the one day more end of play one, mm-hmm. is still my weakest in my opinion. Mm-hmm. I liked the R and J sequence, but mm-hmm. as an episode, it kind of that one Left did you. the least yeah. for me in propelling the plot yeah. forward. That's fair. Yeah, can't go wrong with though with that ranking there. Yeah, I'll have to go back and li- rewatch some of our um, like last episodes so I can make sure my rankings because I do think I did have number two as yeah. my number one last time so i think well, that we'll that's the thing two, we don't six um two, two six five mm-hmm. uh one three four okay. yes okay where is i that's what two three six five one four yeah <laughs> slightly different okay cool slightly different but that's the thing we don't necessarily always have to be consistent with ourselves because week yeah. after week because we see new things we change our opinions yeah uh, some, some things, things get, get paid off which then bumps up another they're... episode yeah. exactly so yeah okay uh well, any last thoughts before we call it um yeah I- i'm just excited yeah i'm just excited for kind of we're, co- we're ramping up into the climax here so I'm just excited to see mm-hmm. how all this wraps up. I mean, the book, I mean, I've been enjoying the book. Uh, at least the audio book, because I don't actually have a physical copy of the book. Um, but overall, I've been enjoying it a great deal. I'm looking forward to seeing what comes next in the story. Uh, well, I mean, I kind of do know what comes next. Uh, but uh, overall, I think this are, is... Are you ahead in the... A like little the, bit of further ahead. Pass, uh, are what, you what, caught yeah, up? once again, I'm a little bit further just because some, some of the actions we moved around. So I know some plot right. points that are coming that haven't shown up yet, but they were would have shown up if you were going chronologically in the book. They would have already shown up a bit here. So yeah, kind of, kind yeah. of like as I so, said, the Hawks yeah. and, and Ralph co- co- conversation. That's coming. okay. Interesting. Yeah. So for me, just in terms of looking forward. I like as I just said, I'm excited to see where it's going and that we're kind of building towards a climax. But to me, mm-hmm. something that I have hesitation about, and we'll see how this pays off as we move forward. Three episodes is still a lot. That's three hours of theater, and a yeah. lot can still happen. And I do worry about losing the momentum that we're building up here. Mm. Uh, because like I think. We could really, I don't know what the climax per se is, but just with what's been happening with Mr. Hawks, with Mr. Squeers, like, I could definitely see this all wrapping up in just one more one hour episode, but there's still three of them. So I'm like, uh oh, what's gonna, like, you know, how how much are we gonna drag our feet and extend this? Or how much did Dickens drag his feet and extend this? (laughs) <laughs> well, we will see. I mean, uh, I mean, yeah. we might both know about a, a, a particular plot point that still has yet to be revealed. Mm-hmm. That right. will be a big reveal when it comes. So yes, uh, yeah. So and things that happened in this episode certainly cast an interesting light on that, which we won't mm-hmm. spoil for anyone who's watching along with us for the first time. But yeah, yeah I I am excited to see where it goes, but I am cautious about wow we still have three hours of this and it feels like we we're pretty close to wrapping it up how are they gonna how are they gonna manage all of this time they have on their hands and i'll be happy to be proven wrong in this concern yeah we will just have to wait and see as they say well uh, yeah i mean uh, let's let's not drag our feet here like what nicholas does sometimes let's just end while we're on top so Cheers, everybody. We will see you next week with our seventh installment of this Nicholas Nickleby mini review series. Have a great week, everybody. Stay healthy, stay safe. Bye!